Stone Temple Pilots was one of the most popular and influential rock bands of the 1990s. Their lead singer, Scott Whelan, uh, was your stereotypical uh, or led the stereotypical life of a rock star full of sex, uh, drugs, alcohol, and addictions. But he kept turning out great music and thrilling and entertaining millions of fans. Making music and living the lifestyle of a rock star was what mattered. But it didn't do very much for his family. And as you might imagine, it led to a divorce. On December 3rd, 2015, Scott Whelan was found dead on his tour bus in Bloomington, Minnesota. Shortly after his death, actually the next week, Scott's ex-wife, Mary, and their at the time 15-year-old son, Noah, and 13-year-old daughter, Lucy, wrote this letter that was published in the Rolling Stone magazine. I'd like to read that for you. So the outpouring of condolences and prayers offered to our children, Noah and Lucy, have been overwhelming appreciated and even comforting. But the truth is, like so many other kids, they lost their father years ago. What they truly lost on December 3rd was hope. I knew Noah and Lucy would one day see and feel everything that I've been trying to shield them from and that they'd eventually be brave enough to say that mess was our father. We loved him, but a deep-rooted mix of love and disappointment made up the majority of our relationship with him. They have never set foot into his house, and they can't remember the last time they saw him on a Father's Day. I don't share this with you to cast judgment. I do it because you most likely know at least one child in the same shoes. If you do, please acknowledge them and their experience. Offer to accompany them to the father-daughter dance, or teach them to throw a football. Just offer or even insist if you have to. This is the final step in our long goodbye to Scott. I won't say he can rest now or that he is in a better place. He belongs with his children, barbecuing in the backyard, waiting for a Notre Dame game to come on. We are angry and sad about his loss, about this loss, but we are most devastated that he chose to give up. Noah and Lucy never sought perfection from their dad. They just kept hoping for a little effort. If you're a parent not giving your best effort, all anyone asks is if you try just a little harder and don't give up. Progress, not perfection, is what your children are praying for. Our hope for Scott has died, but there is still hope for others. Let's choose to make this the first time we don't glorify this tragedy with talk of rock and roll and the demons that, by the way, don't have to come with it. Skip the depressing t-shirt with 1967 to 2015 on it. Use the money to take a kid to a ball game or out for ice cream. Is that heartbreaking? Is that one of the saddest letters you've ever heard? But I so appreciate the courage, uh, the honesty of these three people to write such a letter, to share with us in a tremendous amount of insight, to give us a wake-up call to something like this. And you don't have to be the child of a, a ex, uh, or the ex-wife of a rock star for this to cut to your very soul, to speak to you and, it, and to scream, pay attention, look where your life is going, wake up. Now on this Father's Day 2017, with this letter ringing in our ears, I want to speak to the fathers here today. Uh, I want to speak to the sons and daughters, whether you're still living in your parents' home or whether you're an adult and out on your own. And I want to speak to the church as a whole. I want you and I to avoid, do anything we can to avoid anything that would approach a tragedy like that. <coughs> that people would go through this world feeling that way about fathers. We have a responsibility to our children to our community, and to the world to fulfill our duties as Christians, to do uh, as, as, as Christians in our own families, in our own houses, but also to every person we can reach. Now, very rarely will you ever hear me say this, but I don't want you to turn in your Bibles and follow along. I just want you to listen as I read this very familiar story. It starts in Matthew chapter 1. 
This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home and his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And then to skip a little further down, after the wise men had visited uh, Jesus, it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Joseph. I name a character in this story, a person that's just so easy to overlook. When we think of the nativity, when we think of this great story, it's so easy to overlook Joseph. But when you stop and you read what, and listen to what I just read there, it's, it, you can't deny how remarkable a role that Joseph played in this. Did you notice how many times Joseph's name was mentioned and how many times uh, that he had a pivotal role in the playing out of the, the birth of Jesus? Now, there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from Joseph. And I just, that's what I want to do today is just look at Joseph for just a few minutes and point out a couple of things that we can take away from that. And the first one is this. Joseph listened to God. Isn't that so simple? Joseph just listened to God, and he obeyed. He was obedient to him. How many times in the scriptures that we read did you hear jo it said, Joseph listened, Joseph obeyed? He, just think about it. He was ready to leave Mary when he thought she had been unfaithful and, and was pregnant with somebody else's child. But then God appeared to him in a dream. Joseph listened. Joseph obeyed. And he went, he took Mary home as his wife. Then he listens to God uh, when God speaks to him and he says, you need to escape to Egypt. Who wants to go to Egypt? He's, he's an Israeli. He wants to stay there. But he says, you need to get up. Take Mary and the child and escape to Egypt because Herod's going to try to kill him. And he does it. He just listened and he did it. And then after he'd been in Egypt for a while, another dream comes to him and he says, he says, the one who's been trying to kill the child is now dead. Pick up your stuff, go back to Israel. And he did it. It's just simple listening and obeying. Don't ever question how important Joseph was. I like this. Joseph was the heavenly father's father on the scene. Joseph was the heavenly father's father on the scene. He trusted him to be a part of the plan to save the world. And Joseph obeyed. That is so awesome. That's not to mention the many years that Joseph spent with Jesus as he was growing up and teaching him the scriptures and the things that a good Jewish father would teach his son. The easiest thing for Joseph would have been to just put Mary away. He would have never had to travel to other parts of the world. He never had to pick up and leave his business. None of those things. But he listened. See, Joseph realized he had a calling on his life. 
Joseph realized that there was something special to go on in his life. Now, dads, you may never be called upon to take care of the Son of God. But don't ever, don't ever forget that you have a calling. You have a calling to be a father. I love Ephesians, and I love Ephesians chapter 6 where it says this, start with verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. But then Paul switches and goes right to the father, and he says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, that word exasperate, that's not something we use a lot, but that can mean provoke, frustrate. He says, don't do that. Colossians 3.21 even says it this way. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. And this isn't talking about disciplining them and raising them and, and call, you know, bringing punishment or whatever. It's not talking about that. And we could talk the rest of the day about just what these verses mean. But it's very quick and very easy to understand what Paul is saying in this. That if we do not take our calling seriously to raise our children in the Lord, then we expose them to a great, great risk of them becoming embittered, provoked, discouraged. And it's discouraging them from having a proper view of what a father should be, what a man should be, what parenting, parenting should be, and... A, improper view of what God is to be. That word discouraged and frustrated and exasperated, provoked. The letter I just read, that's children who were discouraged, that were provoked, that were embittered. I, I, that line, it says, that when they were thinking about their father, they said it was a mixture of deep-seated disappointment and love. Disappointment and love. That's what those children were left with. Because the father did not be a father. When a parent, and particularly a father, steps away from his, his God-given calling, he exposes his children to disappointment and discouragement. The second thing is this, real simple. Joseph was a stepfather. Joseph was a stepfather. But aren't all fathers stepfathers? Aren't you all? See, one of the most remarkable things about Joseph is that Jesus was not his earthly son uh, in the sense that he did not share his DNA. Yet Joseph did a thousand things that a biological father does. Joseph did what God the Father would do for him if he was standing there in the fatherly figure. Children, all children, are God's children first. Adults were God's children first. That's why I say... Dads, you're stepfathers to begin with because they're God's children to start with. He's entrusted you just like he entrusted Joseph to raise Jesus for him. Now, you have a lot of freedom to do the things that you want to in raising that son, that daughter. Uh, you, can, you have a lot of freedom in the choices you make. You can, the way you raise them, they'll probably choose their favorite teams or what sports they like to play, who they like to pull for, you, career choices, schools that they go to, um, uh, what time their curfews are, you know, their, their food likes and dislikes, how you discipline, set their curfews. You've got all those type of different freedoms, but... There reaches a point that you do not have the right to veer off of what God has called us to do. You have the freedom, but there reaches a point that we cannot veer off. We cannot be absent. We cannot say, I will raise my children the way I want to. Because they're not ours to start with. The statistics are just shocking. And showing the difference in a child's future when the father is in the home as opposed to being absent from the home. And I mean, I looked up the, some of these things this week, and there's just pages of statistics. The difference when a father is active in a, in a child's life. 85% of children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the national average. 71% of all high school dropouts 
come from fatherless homes. That's nine times the average. 85% of all, all youth in prison come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the national average. Fathers make a difference. Dads, you matter. You are the launch pad for a child's life. You are the training wheels that a child has to begin with. Uh, you, uh, you are the first introduction to what adulthood is, to what a man is, to what God is. How, they, how you do with introducing them with God, how you model what a fatherly figure is may very well go a long way to where they spend eternity. The most important duty a father has is to point his children to God. Now, if you were to listen to the media today and a lot of the textbooks and things, if you were to listen that day, there are no good men, period. I figured I'd get an amen from somewhere. It would just slip out, you know, it would just come out. But if you were to read those things, you would get the impression that there are no good men, that all the world's problems are because of men. Now, we know that's not true, but enough men throughout history have misused their power and their position that has caused great damage in this world, and we're paying the cost for a lot of those problems now. Their failings have given all men a bad name, and that's not fair. But to be fair, we must admit that men have caused a lot of the problems we have. I remember this uh, some years ago, and I, I bet Dolan does too, because I can't remember if it's he had preached on it or I did, but we used this illustration years ago that we read about an inner city mission who were working and going out at nights and just trying to help these runaways in major cities. And I think this one was New York. And these, these young runaways, uh, they were involved in prostitution and drug addiction and uh, it's just terrible things and they would go out at night and try to witness to these kids and I read this article and it so blew my mind that they said that when they talked to these young kids they could not use the term father heavenly father because these kids had such a poor image of what a father was that if they mentioned father in any way it turned them off just like that they couldn't even use that imagery. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that sad that the only fathers, the only men that these, these young, young sons and daughters had ever seen were so bad that they would turn, their, turn away from God, even, even giving him a thought. Now, some of you have had those type of experiences. That the father in your life or the grandfather or an uncle or whatever have been so bad in your life that you equate that with God and you, you won't give him a chance. But I want you to just think about this illustration for just a moment, if that's where you are. How many of you ever gone to a concert? I like concerts. I like live music. I love to go. And, but one of the things that not all concerts, concerts, but most of them have, is what you call the warm-up band or the opening act. And they come out, you know, and they just kind of get the crowd in the mood for the main attraction that's coming later. And to be honest, some of the opening acts are, are really good. And some of them are kind of, eh. And some of them you go, whew, I just wish they'll get over with and bring on the main Main, the one I came for. But no one during the opening act, during the warm up band, no one gets frustrated, gets up, and walks out and says, I'm done. I'm not staying for the main act. Nobody does. Because you realize this isn't the real thing yet. And if you're one of those people, men or women, that a father, a grandfather, an uncle, somebody has failed you so poorly. I want you to know, as important as they are, they are the opening act. They are the warm-up to the Heavenly Father. Don't walk out on him. Don't give up. 
because the great father is yet to come. There's a passage of scripture that so many times we just hear this at Christmas, and I never think about it uh, in any other way. Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet says this. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. We know what we're talking talking about, coming of Jesus. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. How many times I just hadn't thought about that? Everlasting Father, when he talks about Jesus coming. He is our Everlasting Father. All of these titles can only be fulfilled in God himself. Don't give up on the main act. And I want to leave you with a couple of practical things that we can do here. The first one is this. Be a Joseph or a Josephine. I, here's I'm, I'm, I'm going out to women here now. Be a Joseph or a Josephine. Be a Joseph in your homes. Imitate what he did. Listen to God. Obey him. Fulfill your calling. Lead your family to church. Don't just allow your family to go to church or say, oh, it's fine if they go. I just don't want to be a part of it. You lead your family to church. Don't distract your family from church. Don't be the reason your child loses interest in God later because of your behavior earlier. I think that of all the good things I see about fathers, I think that's the biggest mistake we make is that we distract our family from God. I shudder to think the number of good men who stand before God and will answer for the distractions they put in front of their children and wives when it came to being a part of the church. Second thing is this, practical thing to do. Make faith at home a part of your family life. Now, this is something we started over a year ago. The sheets are on the inside aisle uh, of the pews there. Tonight is family night. Uh, we're at fa- faith at home night. We ask you to do some of these things, one of these things with your family. Um, do it now. The earlier you start, trust me, the easiest, easier it is going to be. I am amazed and I'm disappointed at times that the pushback we get on this. We're asking you one Sunday night a month to do something with your family. And if you don't have children at home, then go do something with your grandchildren. If you don't have grandchildren, you find somebody to reach out to. But start doing it. I've got to tell you this beautiful little story. Uh, Stephen and Jenny Lilly have Kate and Sadie. Uh, Kate is... uh, uh, Jenny and Stephen have started, uh, and one of the first steps in the faith at home process is you begin to pray over your children at night, and you bless them every night. And Jenny was reading the prayer, or reciting the prayer that's found in Numbers. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may his face shine upon you. And that last line, and it says, and may he bring you peace. And Jenny said about the third night of praying that, Kate at the end says, but mommy, I don't like peas, (laughs) P-E-A-S. That's my kind of child. (laughs) It's not all going to be smooth. But I guarantee you that will be a part of something that Kate remembers for her entire life. Is her mom and dad blessing her every night. Get started with it. Start wherever you are. Pick up where you can. The second thing is this. Be a Joseph outside of the home. The children in our world and in our community are now a generation or two or maybe three who are now adults who have never seen or experienced a good father. So this problem just keeps repeating itself and just just keeps on reproducing itself. Some of the kids in our community have no idea what a good man, what a good mother it, it really is, what a church really is like what a Christian looks like. So that's why we try very hard to do things like this, to be part of blessings in a backpack, 
and our seniors ministry has taken the lead in that where we, we fix those things up to send home with these children so they'll have something to eat on weekends. We volunteer to go out into the schools and be a part so they can see that there are people who really do care. That's why Eric, for, I don't know, somewhere between five and ten years, we've been doing the angel tree uh, gifts where we uh, adopt a child whose mother or father or mother and father who are, are in prison. And those ch children will get a Christmas, get Christmas presents. That's why Janice and others have led some efforts to get into uh, some of our local schools around Christmas. And we find out children who are not going to have a Christmas and we buy them coats and things like that. So they will know that there are people who care. That's why night of lights and things like that are important. Uh, you know, there are a lot of problems in our communities and the different uh, areas of our community. But they need to know that there, are, that there are churches who do care and care about the community. And some of these, on Night of Lights especially, there's a large portion of Hispanic and, and the, the African American community. And for them to see that you, us a predominantly white church, we care that much, it speaks, it says something. That's why we support missions and efforts that actually go out and rescue children, buy them back out of slavery, get them out of prostitution, train them, give them a place to live, and then start them on life all over again. They must know that people are looking for them. It's a terrible thing to be lost, but it's terrible to be lost and know that no one's looking for you. They need to know that we're looking for them. They need, now this is the thing, they need to know that they need to have, that we want them to have a chance to know this father. Isaiah 9, 6 again. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting father. Prince of peace. I was fortunate enough to be raised in a home and in a community and in a church that I got to know from very early that. Don't mistakenly think that just because we know it that the rest of the world has that advantage we've got to be the Josephs the Josephines to go out there and do that to give it a chance